Eternals from director and co-writer Chloe Zhao has opened in theaters, actually drawing the lowest rated Rotten Tomatoes score of any MCU film in history thus far. First of all, Elizabeth, it is not a bad movie in the slightest. I think it's one of Marvel's best efforts thus far. What? What the fuck? Has great action. It focuses a lot on story. It's diverse, has great characters, all that. I think this speaks to a larger problem that is in the industry. Anytime a woman takes on the action genre, which has been typically made for men to helm, people come harder on that filmmaker when she takes it on. I think it's, I think it's the issue that needs to be addressed. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. Nerdorotic.com. Let's get this straight right off the bat. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what your identity is. I don't care what God you pray to. I don't care what junk is in your pants. You direct a bad film, you get treated just like Jar Jar Abrams, Rianne Johnson, Paul Feig, Tim Miller, or Alex Kurtzman. In other words, you get treated just like everyone else. Yes, women can direct as poorly as men. Marvel's Eternals has arrived, and it's been a week since my last video, and a lot has changed. Things have gotten worse because the film was actually released. Eternals has been banned in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. And while I credit Disney for not editing out any content, Disney still does business there. The one thing no one is mentioning is it's still banned in China for probably a lot of the same reasons. Then there was those early box office projections. Screen Rant reported it was to be the highest grossing film in the MCU phase bore, projected to get up to $100 million over over its opening weekend, but after adjusting that projection last minute, it either soared to $69.5 million or it's a wake-up call for Marvel. The critic score is now 48% on Rotten Tomatoes. Not that I really care what they think. I just find it amusing that they have turned on their masters. Now that they've had their say, it's my turn. Back in March of 2018, Warner Brothers announced that they were going to adapt Jack Kirby's New Gods, directed by woman of color Ava DuVernay, written by Tom King. Coincidentally, a month later, Marvel announced that they were going to adapt Jack Kirby's The Eternals, directed by woman of color Chloe Zhao, written by two 12-year-olds. Fast forward to April 1st of 2021, and this wasn't an April Fool's, Warner Brothers cancels Jack Kirby's New Gods from woman of color director Ava DuVernay. Since then, woman of color director Ava DuVernay has blamed the Snyder Cut for the canceling of New Gods, but I think it was just a rare time where America's dumbest company made a smart move, unlike Marvel with the Eternals. Now, I am in no way affiliated with Warner Brothers or Zack Snyder, but you have to admit the Snyder Cut got Jack Kirby right. The Snyder Cut did Jack Kirby's work justice. Marvel shamed it. Marvel's Eternals has been called the most ambitious film they've ever made. It's been called different, it's been called diverse, and it's also been called a complete disaster. A movie filled with first. The first film to be directed by a woman of color since the last film directed by a woman of color. The first film with diversity since the last film with diversity. The first film with a Marvel sex scene. The first film with a Marvel gay couple. The first film with a Marvel gay kiss. The first Marvel film to save lives. And it's also the first MCU film to go rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. Incidentally, it's also the first Marvel film where the two lead actors go the entire film without changing their facial expressions. They're the same! face doesn't anyone notice this i feel like i'm taking crazy pills why did i start out with all that news well it's far more interesting than the actual film but let's get into it well look we all were there for avengers endgame we lost some heavy hitters and it's important to introduce some new heroes that hopefully people really invest in i mean top to bottom i think this cast is as strong as we ever had and the hope is this can be somebody's new favorite uh, franchise <laughs> You serious? Is Eternals as bad as they say? Yeah, it is. It's Marvel's worst film. For those of you who haven't seen Marvel's Eternals yet, don't. My review won't be saving any lives, but I could save you some time. Overall, it's long, it's boring, it's dreary, it has a beige color palette, and it's shot too dark. Think Game of Thrones Long Night, except with your eyes closed. And the only thing worse than the dialogue is the horrific CGI, and I mean horrific. And to think this film cost more than Dune to make. 
As I've said about everything Marvel this year with Phase 4, there was a good concept here that could have been fun and entertaining, but they decided to prioritize the message over good storytelling and completely ignore what this film should have been, a giant four-color love letter to Jack Kirby. And hands down, the worst superhero costumes of any superhero film. Marvel's laziest effort to date in a year of some pretty lazy storytelling. And the fight choreography just looked like choreography in front of a green screen. What did I like? A bit of the sprite arc, if that's what you want to call it. That was borrowed from Neil Gaiman's run and the Celestials. That's it. Is it as woke and intersectional as the marketing made it out to be? Absolutely, as the day is long. Eternals takes about an hour and 45 minutes to introduce all of its characters. I'm going to try to do it a little faster than that. We'll start with the most recognizable character, even from the comics, Icarus, played by Richard Madden. Circe, played by Gemma Chan, who is the star of the film. Thena, played by Angelina Jolie, who has the Eternals version of PTSD. Dane Whitman, played by Kit Harington, who will eventually become Black Knight, but in this film, he's the Manzel in distress. Sprite, played by Liam McHugh. How dare you! Who is a 7,000-year-old being trapped in the body of a 14-year-old girl. Makari, played by Lauren Ridolph, who is a speedster and a character race and gender swap from a redhead ginger side is real. And Mar Marvel's first deaf superhero. Gilgamesh, played by Don Lee, who is a Korean playing Gilgamesh. Ajak, played by Selma Hayek. The race and gender swap character is the leader of the Eternals. Kingo, played by Kumail Ninjani. The Pakistani actor plays a Bollywood dancer who can shoot energy balls out of his fingers. Bastos, played by Brian Tyree Henry, who is body positivity Dr. Manhattan, and Marvel really wants us to know that he's gay. You know what's never saved the planet? Your sarcasm. Drug, played by Barry Kogan, or Dollar Store Ezra Miller to you and me. Erishim, the prime celestial. Then there's the deviants who look like monsters made out of cables, but they are not the villain. That's supposed to be a big twist that I suspect most of you could see coming from a mile away. The Deviants were created by the Celestials. They went rogue, so the Celestials had to create the Eternals to fight them, or so we're told. They arrive at Earth at 5000 BC, and yes, there are a lot of questions. How do they have accents for languages that aren't even developed? How does Makari use American Sign Language? Why are a couple of them completely out of shape? Why would one of them be deaf? These aren't just regular superheroes. These are OP superheroes superheroes and the answer is i really have no idea because they don't really explain it in the film i'm guessing it's all part of kang's plan every step you took to get here i paved the road it's explained in the trailer and the film that the Eternals are only there to fight the Deviants. They're not supposed to interfere in any human affairs, although they do, and they aren't supposed to fight in any wars, and they aren't supposed to fight Thanos, although Thanos in the comics is an Eternal with the Deviant mutation. 1,500 years before present day in the MCU, they end up defeating all the Deviants and going their separate ways, but they do have different opinions on how they should do that. Icarus questions Ajak, and he thinks they should go to Erishim first before they make any decisions and Ajak tells Icarus she doesn't need his opinion and for him to know his place. Down with the patriarchy. There is no context for her snapping at Icarus like this other than to tell the white man to shut up while all around them Spanish conquistadors are slaughtering indigenous people. Now there's a montage of Cersei and Icarus hooking up and literally hooking up on the beach that you can barely see because it's shot so dark. Imagine a mannequin laying on top of another mannequin. They end up getting married in a sense and spend thousands of years together but eventually break up for mysterious reasons. A running theme through all all of phase four is tell not show and there is no context for next to anything in this film lines come out of nowhere actions come out of nowhere and there are massive singularity size plot holes cersei settles down in london and ends up hooking up with Jon snow she seems to like those stark boys i'm wondering if bran thinks he has a chance why do you think i came all this way Dina has madrari which is kind of an eternals ptsd which causes her to turn on her team and possibly kill them so gilgamesh offers to watch over her in solitude. 
Right after Ajak told Icarus to know his place, Druig decides to break the rule of interference and mind control the remaining conquistadors and indigenous people, and he goes off and forms a cult in the Amazon. Fast forward to current day where Sprite is living with Cersei, who was dating Jon Snow, and there's a global earthquake, and then they're attacked by a deviant while they're out in a date and saved by Icarus. They decide to go back to their boss, Ajak, in South Dakota, and they find her dead, murdered by the deviant crow, or so we think. Basically, this is Marvel's PG-13 version of The Watchmen written by a 6th grader. Cersei is posthumously chosen by Ajak as her successor and granted the ability to talk to Erishim. Cersei learns that the Deviants were basically a mistake by Erishim and the Eternals were created to cull them because they are killing indigenous populations of planets which are necessary to birth Celestials. Celestials basically feed off the cosmic energy of life. Erishim explains that he has planted thousands of seeds throughout the universe and the only reason the universe stays in existence is because of the Celestials. Now, it turns out Thanos' snap prolonged the emergence on Earth, but now that that's been reversed, Earth has achieved the necessary population to birth Tiamat, meaning if the Avengers had succeeded against Thanos initially, Tiamat would have risen six or seven days later. But remember, all of this happened because of Kang's sacred timeline. And that's the Gambit! Now, in the comics, the Eternals are humanoid. They are long-lived, but they are not technically Eternals. In the MCU, they're robots. And Erishim specifically says they are robots that are programmed, which creates a bit of a problem that we'll get into. Cersei learns that they have all been lied to by Ajak and Erishim. They aren't from the planet Olympia. They are robots that get their minds wiped every time there is an emergence. Now, when they were first attacked by Crow the Deviant, they noticed he had healing powers just like Ajak, and they suspect that he took them from her. That is what you call a clue to who the real bad guy is. They decide to get the band back together to stop the emergence, and while they're trying to get Druig to join the team in the Amazon, they are attacked by the Deviants again. Gilgamesh is killed by Crow, who adapts his powers and becomes humanoid and able to speak. And with his first opportunity to use the words, he very eloquently describes himself as a pawn in Erishim's game, and the Eternals are just murderers. Never mind all those people the Deviants killed. And about an hour and a half into the story, we visit Fastos. And in this one scene, we have inclusivity, LGBTQ plus representation, body positivity representation. We have achieved maximum diversity. Fastos has given up on humanity after he gave them the atom bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. They convince Fastos to help, and he comes up with a plan to use the Unimind. Eternals share cosmic energy with the Celestials so they can use that against them by combining their powers through Druig's mind control powers and put Tiamat to sleep. And the pacing of this film is just terrible. It ends up being an hour and a half of introductions, and we get to the very contrived third act. It turns out Icarus was told by Ajak centuries ago that the emergence was going to happen and all life on this planet would eventually die. That ended up essentially breaking him and that's why he broke up with Cersei. That's right. Our expectations were subverted. They took the most recognizable Eternal and turned him into the Ozymandias of this story. Icarus ends up murdering Ajak by throwing her to the re-emerged Deviants and then allowing the Deviants to run about to distract the Eternals to keep them from stopping Stopping the emergence. I am utterly shocked. Who could have seen this happening? Icarus, you see, is blindly loyal, helping prop up an unjust system. Down with the patriarchy. And what a clever idea. Bad Superman. I've never seen that before. The team figures out bad Superman trope killed Ajax, Earth's destruction, and he also warns them he'll kill all of them if they try to stop the emergence. Stop the emergence, save the Earth, but you also prevent billions of other life forms being created. This sets up a decent moral dilemma that in time could have been compelling, but instead they had to rush out to beat up the white guy. Then bad Superman trope takes off and Sprite goes with him. By the way, she's in love with him. I guess it's important to point out that in the 7,000 years Cersei's been around the planet she's never really tested the limit of her powers because she surprisingly turns a deviant into a tree this is important later so there's a big battle at a volcano in the indian ocean where tiamat is emerging Everyone on the team gets their shots in on Icarus. I wonder what they're trying to say here. Another one of those lines that comes out of nowhere is body positivity Dr. Manhattan screaming, I've always wanted to clip your wings to Icarus. There's no context for this line in the film. All prior interactions were amicable. This simply was a symbolic line. There's a big gobbledygook CGI fest where Icarus is defeated, then he wins, and then he decides to join the Eternals with the Unimine and Cersei, who recently discovered after 7,000 
and years that she's pretty damn powerful, turns Tiamat into marble. Icarus, ridden with guilt, says he's sorry to Cersei and then flies into the sun. The Eternals split up. Some take off to go look for other Eternals. The ones that are left behind end up getting abducted by Erishim, and he's going to come back and judge the Earth at a later date. There's no other way to put it. Marvel has gone full CW. If things weren't bad enough, and normally I would be excited about this, the post credit scene had Star Fox in it, played by Harry Styles, and Pip the Troll, voiced by Pat Oswald. I just want to be done. I had to watch this film a second time, and I know I could go into the inconsistencies, but the writing is so bad, it almost feels like a waste of time. I mean, why should I point out that a character that's a 14-year-old girl for thousands of years wouldn't change her hairstyle once? Having more characters in your film does not give it character, yet it's the most important thing in it. If they aren't interesting, then your eyes start wandering to the corners of the screen. Then you end up with a film called Eternals that gets forgotten in a couple of weeks. But in the end, it's the story, it's the writing, and it was all over the place, and I just couldn't wait for this film to end. I have never considered walking out of a superhero film in my life until this one. When you say the word Eternals to a comic book fan, the first thing that pops to their mind is Icarus, and you took that character and you made him a bad guy. So is it Marvel taking chances with lesser known characters, or Marvel just being thorough? I've been warning this is going to happen for quite some time, and it looks like a lot of people have started to come around and including John Olsensky from the New York Post. Please kill the Marvel Cinematic Universe before it's too late. Just a couple of highlights from this article, including this image. The MCU's best days are behind it. Before the pandemic, we were force-fed flavorless Soylent Green like Captain Marvel and Ant-Man and the Wasp, which I like to call Wasp and Ant-Man, and there will be more uninspired crapola so much more. Getting out while the getting is good and ensuring a legacy goes against the modern more, more, more attitude. Instead, we wring out every last penny from something until it dies a pathetic death. And I can hear you say, it's not over for Marvel. We still have Spider-Man No Way Home, and I would agree with you. That film is going to be a huge success and really shine a light on how unsuccessful the previous Marvel films have been in the MCU Marvel phase bore. And why is that film going to be a success? Not because of Tom Holland, because of Andrew Garfield, of all people, and Tobey Maguire. Hey, if you like this film, then... Oh! Oh, good for you! But I'm calling it right here. There is no more Marvel. There is only Disney. The consumption is complete, and what we have left is a crapped out Eternals. Is the door to Iron Man totally closed? Because I don't believe it is. Oh, you guys can go through time now. You can go, there's, there was, you know, you already know. opened up that door. Let me ask you the question. If I pick the jersey back up and put it on, wouldn't you feel a little bit like, oh, no. crap. No. Oh. Here's here's what I think. Right. They go through a few semi lackluster <laughs> Avengers movies without you. Nerdorotic.com. Please subscribe. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video.